Hi, I'm Veronica Manuel, and I'm joined by Ben Gertzel of Singularity Net today. He is a man who needs very little uh, forward introduction, but today we are going to discuss artificial general intelligence, Grace the Robot, and his work at Singularity Net. Ben, thanks so much for speaking with me today. Yeah, it's a, pl it's a pleasure. Look forward to our chat. Awesome. Um, you know, you're famous for so much of your work in AGI. And for that, I was curious, who are some people that inspire you the most, thought leaders that inspire you the most? Thought leader. I, 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 don't, I don't know to what extent I'm uh, in, inspired by 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 thought leaders that's that's a, that's a interest interesting interesting question I, actually I, I what I what I what I try to do is learn from much younger people around me because I'm, I'm 56 years old and I, I I feel like this is an age where you can become like trapped in uh, trapped in your, your your old ways old ways of thinking so I I, I, I try to take a as mentors, people people under the under the age of, of, of thirty. So I'm I'm uh, I'm inspired by the kids in my my son's preschool all the time. We're like age, age, age three, four, and five because they're, they're just like uh, exploring and, and playing with with random stuff with very very few few presuppositions. And I'm you know we've got we've got an AI development office in Singularity Net in Ethiopia in in Addis Ababa, and I'm I'm inspired by a bunch of the people in, in, in that team all the time. So as one, one, one person we have there is uh, Betty Desi, Bethlehem Desi, who, who was my daughter's college roommate for a while when my daughter did her exchange year of university at Addis Ababa University in, in Ethiopia. And Betty, Betty must be maybe 25 now or something, but she... She started supporting her family by programming at age age fourteen, and she's she's now got a few dozen people working for her in Ethiopia. She has something called the the Digit Truck. So they got this big semi truck, this tractor trailer. It's filled with tablets, laptops, and, and little robots. They drive around Ethiopian countryside. They stay like two weeks in each village. They teach the local kids there programming and robotics and leave some little robots and tablets behind then then go on to the, go on to the next village right so that that's that's inspiring it sounds like a lot of fun i sort of wish i had time to to join them on the on a digit truck expedition through ethiopian countryside but the internet connectivity is poor there it would be hard to run singularity net from from the from the the digit truck i guess but and anyway B B betty is one source of one source of inspiration that's cool um is it the inspiration is mostly for how to model the robots uh ai it, it, or is it more on a personal level uh that you're inspired it's just it's just it's just cool to be going out there and spreading AI and robotics and not just the vision of the singularity, but the practical skills to participate. It's pretty mm -hmm. cool to be spreading that in all these sort of uh, rural African tribal villages where they have minimal electricity and minimal level of literacy or, or numeracy, right? So that's a inspiring thing to do. I mean, I mean, Betty could have just moved to, U.S. or U.K. and got the job at a tech company, her, her, her life would be would be a lot easier. So, uh, <laughs> another an, another another source of inspiration who's a, a little older is uh, my friend uh, Julia Mossbridge, who is a, is a, is, a, is, a, is a neuroscientist who I I actually. I met due to a mutual interest in a bunch of weird stuff like uh, precognition and, and e ESP and par paranormal phenomena, which I spent some time studying the statistical evidence for and potential 
sort of scientific under underpinnings of. And, you know, when I met Julia, she was skeptical of transhumanists and singularitarians and people who believe that, you know, we could make ourselves live essentially forever by repairing aging in the body and who believe we'll create superhuman AGI that can, can sort of save the world and solve all the problems at, at, at the human level. And mm -hmm. she may still be a little, a little bit skeptical, but I mean, as technology has been advancing, she's uh, opened her mind up more to the fact that these things might be all, all, all for the good and like the, the desire some of us have to not die and live forever isn't just about ego. It's just like life is good and why not extend, why not extend, extend more of it. She started exploring the notion that, okay, if you have retrocausal influence, like quantum mechanics has in some sense, and like mm -hmm. you may see in, in paranormal phenomena, maybe, maybe some of the super minds that emerged after the singularity have figured out how to reach back in time and place into our minds now the seeds of how to bring about the singularity. So maybe, maybe the singularity will be created by a closed time-like loop. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm proud of Julia for being, being willing to put these, these crazy ideas out, out, out there, out there online, even though people will think she, she's completely nuts because she's actually a quite, a quite rigorous scientist. <laughs> Um, just, you know, just, I, I wasn't just expecting a, just to start us off on something complete, completely insane so that <laughs> when we get to singular in an ocean protocol, it will sound very boring, normal and down to earth. Right. Yeah. And that was kind of my idea when talking to you and preparing for this, that I wanted to go a little bit casual off the, you know, beaten path of decentralization and not that that is like uh not important it is of course you know you built singularity net and uh, we as well think a lot of uh blockchain uh and decentralized approaches to problem solving you know really being important but um so much of uh what the talks are that i uh have seen you in were like very interesting you know personality kind of um uh, and uh like I guess, AGI questions that were unusual or unconventional. And that's kind of why I uh, was hoping that we could talk about some of this, uh, like yeah. kind of well, I've, 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 I've had that feeling. I've had the feeling lately that, you know, most of my life I've been working on AGI and people thought it was insane and totally unrealistic. And when, when I started talking about decentralizing AI in the, mid 90s when the internet first became a well-known thing people also thought that was completely nuts so now that now that agi is mainstream and that even the idea that ai maybe should be decentralized and not in the hands of a few elite groups even that is becoming mainstream we discussed it a bunch last week at the AI for Good United Nations Conference in Geneva. So since, since these things I've been working on all my life are becoming accepted, on the one hand, it's exciting. I mean, it provides a context in which we can really make things happen that have been just been dreams for a long time. On the other hand, in part of my mind, it gives me the desire to go work on something even weirder that nobody, nobody, nobody accept, accepts yet, like trying to trying to build a reincarnation machine or something because not now now every, every everyone's doing AGI it's not even interesting anymore but of, of course of course actually building the AGI still is interesting you know? I mean the, the fact that everyone's excited about it now is great but it's still not here right and we still don't right. have we still don't have a large scale decentralized AI yet yet either right so I, I mean while the the broader acceptance of these ideas, is cool and in a way takes some of the edge off it. I mean, now I think in the next few years, we're at the stage where with Singularity Net, Ocean Protocol, a whole bunch of associated projects, like we're at the point where the dreams all become real and deployed at large scale with everybody using them, which is, is pretty exciting too. Yeah, it's cool. Um, you know, a lot of these 
questions uh, that you saw so many years ago uh, and that are now getting hip, um, you know, and then you wanted to kind of be like the ultimate hipster and, and do something even wackier and more different and unique. But um, what is it about like AGI and coding AGI that like, what are some of the like fun things that happen when you're coding uh, like the OpenCog Hyperon, uh, for example, that you're like, you know, today, you know, I had a fun time coding empathy, you know, or like what it like, what are the fun things that you find about it? Of course, there's a lot of coding that's tedious too. Uh, well, the and interesting but... things, the, the interesting things aren't necessarily what you code. The interesting things are what emerges from a software system that you didn't necessarily plan to put in there, right? And I mean, I mean, that's always been what's more fun about. AI than about sort of plain vanilla software development. I mean, with a yeah. with a typical software program, typical software program, you know what behavior you want, and then you're designing right. a program to yield that behavior. And there's an art, there's an art and a science to it, and it's difficult and often interesting. But what's what's always been intriguing about AI is that you're you're implementing a learning or reasoning mechanism and then you don't mm -hmm. you don't know you don't know what's going to pop out when you expose that mechanism to to data or to, or to or to experience right and i mean that's 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 what's fun and unique on ai and i mean that's that's what was so cool about gpt4 and and chat gpt which which open AI launch based on, you know, algorithms developed previously within Google, Google brain and Mountain View mostly. I mean, what was cool there is, you know, there's nothing very new about that software architecture. There was nothing all that new about the original transformer neural net that Google developed in 2017, 18, even mm -hmm. less new about the GPT systems that open AI developed. But when you train this system on a huge amount of data, mm -hmm. And then start asking it questions on uh, trained it on enough computers, right? I mean, suddenly it started to do things that are surprising, and no, no one imagined imagined they would do. And I mean, few shot learning is one example. Suddenly, when you get these systems to a certain scale, you can train them on just a very few examples to 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 do something instead of needing thousands of examples. It's like three examples, right? So this ability to learn from very few examples. Like we always knew little kids could do this, right? Then mm. suddenly the ability to learn from very few examples popped out of these transformer neural networks almost as if by magic when you got them up to a certain scale. Now it's not it's not really by magic. And after you see it, of course you can you can plunge in and, and un, un, understand uh, understand why it happened. But it, it's it, that's 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 the magic of, of AI, right? And, and we're, we're, we're seeing that not yet in as sort of publicly accessible ways as, as with ChatGPT yet, though that's coming, but we're, we're seeing that in other more sort of uh, in-depth AI work that we're doing within, within the SingularityNet ecosystem. So, so I mean, so SingularityNet, as most people listening to this already know, it's sort of a decentralized AI platform that lets anyone put an AI agent online connected to the Singularity Net protocol. It talks to other agents that are online connected by that by that protocol, and then they can outsource work to each other, collaborate with each other. They can solve problems that people pose them. You can use that to run pretty much any sort of AI. OpenCog Hyperon is our own AI framework, which combines deep neural nets with logical reasoning, evolutionary learning, and other sorts of algorithms in sort of updating this common decentralized knowledge graph. So OpenCog Hyperon, it's one among the many AI systems you could deploy on top of SingularityNet. It's the mm -hmm. AI system that I'm spending a bunch of time working on because I think it has a good chance of getting to, to AGI. And yeah, one thing 
we've been playing with recently is using a large language model like GPT-4 or like Llama, which is an open source large, large language model that you can just host mm -hmm. and run yourself. We've been using that to translate language, English, into logic expressions. So you can basically turn informal English into formal logical statements. And you can, you can coax a large language model to do that translation for you, right? So then mm -hmm. we've been experimenting with that, but then f using that to feed a whole bunch of knowledge into OpenCog's knowledge graph and then do reasoning within, within OpenCog's, OpenCog's knowledge graph. And so this, this is... This you could do for a wide variety of purposes. One thing we've been looking at is longevity research. So we're taking a bunch of research papers about what makes some people live a long time, what makes some animals live a long time, taking the data associated with those papers from ge ge genomics and clinical medicine and using mm -hmm. large language models to take the information from these research papers and the associated data sets feed it all into, into OpenCUG's knowledge graph, then do reasoning on that and see what pops out, right? And that, now we're, we're trying to discover new, new longevity therapies that way. And what, what you mm -hmm. can find is, I mean, the AI reasoning algorithms can pop up suggestions like, well, why don't you, why don't you hit up this transcription factor pathway with, with, with some drug or some gene therapy, right? And, and it can be quite indirect. Like none of the research papers you fed in contains that suggestion. The AI right. is combining bits and pieces from different research papers in its own reasoning algorithm. And it's popping mm -hmm. up some suggestion for what, what combinations of genes to hit, to hit with, a, with, with, with the therapy. And it's not at this point, necessarily replacing human insight, but it's coming up with a type of insight that humans don't come up with because the AI is good at combining a large number of pieces of, of weak evidence to, co to come to a, to a conclusion. And the mm -hmm. human mind isn't, isn't as, as, as good as that. So, I mean, as of now, the human mind can come up with types of medical, biological insight that AI can't. The AI can come mm -hmm. up with types of insight the person can't. So it's like, it's a fun phase because it's like you as a human mind are working together with this different sort of mind and putting your minds together to try to come up with come up with insights, in this case regarding what lab experiments to run to try to see if you have something that can, that can prolong prolong human life, right? So that's uh, that's it's more obscure, like chat GPT is doing stuff anyone can play with, which 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 is amazing. This sort of use of neural symbolic AI for longevity research, it's a little more obscure because you have to you have to know what these transcription factor pathways are to like appreciate what the AI is coming up with. But it's been revolutionary from my view because I've been working on machine learning for longevity research since 2001 or two, but only mm. in the last year or so are we really seeing the AI like bubble up so many interesting new new suggestions so 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 quickly and then then we have we're working with these fruit flies so we have fruit flies that live five or eight times as long as normal fruit flies and so we have some data data there on why they live so long but then when we when we come up with new therapies we can try them on these fruit flies first see if they mm -hmm. make normal fruit flies live a long time see if they make them better resemble genomically the long-lived fruit flies and so forth so we try them ai comes up with a therapy suggestion that no human would have ever thought of we try mm -hmm. it out on flies and if it works on flies you can try it out next on mice and, and next next on on humans so yeah this this stuff is a collaboration of a project called rejuve biotech which we spun off of singularity net so it's rejuve biotech using using uh OpenCog AI tools running running on on SingularityNet platform. So yeah, that's that's one example of of, of cool stuff. Actually, so, something else that we haven't launched publicly yet, but but I think we'll soon. So this uh, we're 
which will be more accessible to average people. So we're we're launching a virtual world called Sophiaverse, which is like a metaverse with AI woven in at the core. And that there's a, you can look at Sophiaverse.ai. That's actually doing a token sale soon. But so we'll, we'll have non-player characters that are like avatars of the Sophia robot. And mm -hmm. we will soon integrate generative AI where you can like define what you want to see in the world. Like, you know, build me a castle with seven spires and flying dragons around, around, around the top. And the inside should be all uh, traditional Japanese furniture. Then the AI will just spin <laughs> up that construct in the, in the virtual world for you. So you, you, mm -hmm. you don't have to build it by pointing and clicking. You just describe it in text and the AI, AI will build it. But then we're, we're creating, as well as the Sophia avatars, we're creating a native species called Neoterex, the new people, which are like the, these little little humanoid creatures that will run around in the virtual world, try to figure out how to build stuff. They have to create their own languages for, for talking to each other and, 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 and doing things. And this, this is OpenCog Hyperon also. I mean, it uses, it uses a framework for scalable deployment of OpenCog Hyperon that we call True AGI, which you can find out about at, at trueagi.io. But this, uh, we haven't launched that publicly yet, but just in early prototype experiments, it, it's quite cool to see like what happens when you make these a new species of like, little AI controlled characters in a little tribe buzzing around and trying to learn learn to do stuff together. And that's that that I'm hoping can yield new sorts of emergence sort of at the social psychology level. Like you, you want to see what patterns of behavior little agents will will emerge on their own when they're trying to build stuff together, which is too hard for any one agent to build, but you need a bunch of them to to, to cooperate, right? And I, I tried to do experiments like this decades together also, and the computers were just too slow. So now, now you have the ability to, to do experiments like this, either on centralized server farm or by pulling together resources from a whole bunch of different machines. Like you, you could have each of those little guys have their AI running on a different machine, right? Mm -hmm. And that, that could even be, one could be running on someone's phone or someone's laptop. And we have a framework called NuNet that, that lets, lets all these disparate processing power sources be leveraged together. So like each little AI, each little Neoteric living in Sophiaverse, their mind can be running on a different machine. NuNet provisions uh -huh. the resources. Singularity Net mediates the communication among among all these all these resources, and then they're all buzzing around doing stuff, and that will be people can interact with them via Sophiaverse once once that once that's launched. So, so I mean, you can't you can't play with them in, in Sophiaverse yet. We're just playing with them in the research lab, but that that should be launched not too long from now. That's cool. So in essence, it's like uh, each individual uh you call them uh neo neo what the, these little guys these little guys are neoterics which is neoterics old, uh, yeah so neoterics, it, which mean, just means new, new people so yeah so it, it sounds kind of like you know when you explain it to me at least it almost makes me think of like what other critters like in the animal kingdom are like that so um and the reason my brain goes to that is uh, you're talking about each and uh, Neo Terra, Neo Neo Terra, <laughs> Neo something, sure. right? Uh, li little mini AI bot. Um, sorry, I don't know why I just forgot that. But um, each individual AI personality running on different hardware, but yet working in a collective way via Singularity Net. It sounds almost like a collective intelligence that you're building, uh, whereas each individual uh, AI uh, personality has their own kind of decentralized, um, their own centralized yet decentralized way of thinking. Like they have their own mind in a centralized sense, but then that is levering a bunch of decentralized AI algorithms to perform like complex tasks and even more complex together. And so I kind of think of it as, um, you know, like if you have um, 
you know, like a, a mammal with a larger uh, computational hardware, right? Working alongside, you know, an insect that doesn't have as big of computational hardware, uh, you know, whereas that might be a smaller, uh, like a smartphone processor, right? As opposed to like, you know, much more serious rig. And, uh, and then they're collaborating somehow to build this castle with flying dragons. I guess, am I picking up like what you're explaining kind of correctly or am I missing the mark? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really an open-ended e experiment, right? So, I mean, we have, we have a proto-AGI architecture, which is OpenCog Hyperon. And then we have a mm -hmm. decentralized tech stack, which, which we can use to help run that, which I've explained some, some ingredients of, right? There's Singularity Net platform. There's yeah. new net that allows you to deploy different resources. There's other pieces like HyperCycle, which is a novel ledgerless blockchain that some folks in our ecosystem have, have launched. Certainly, there's potential ways to pull in ocean to help with the, with some of the the data related needs of this ecosystem. And we've been talking with Trent and Ezra and others in the the ocean protocol world about 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 that. So then you, you can use this whole decentralized proto AGI stack to do a lot of a lot of different things, right? And so there's there's highly practical applications like trying to cure aging with Reduve Biotech, or right. I mean, we would like to we would like to launch something that's similar to ChatGPT, but smarter with more creativity and better better groundedness in 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 fact. And there's a there's a project called Zarka Z A R Q A in Singular the ecosystem that's focused on that. But in addition to these practical projects, I think. If we want to really get to thinking machines, you know, you, you want to have the AGI available just to just to play and experiment and do do random stuff, right? Like, I mean, yeah. little little kid, little kids learn to be adult minds by mm -hmm. just playing and exploring in a sort of random way, not just by trying to do do useful things, right? So we. I mean, yeah. we do want to use this tech stack to do useful and valuable things. I mean, that's how you get traction on, on, on a platform and you're delivering value to people and you're making money, right? But uh, on the other hand, I think you also need that that free play aspect. And of course, it'd be great to do that with robots. And we're looking at that with Hanson Robotics, who builds the Grace Sophia Desmona robots. We're, we're looking right. at could be maybe make a smaller a smaller robot that's cheaper to make, no no risk to fall down on you, and can just be like a, a robot toddler that that people can teach and interact with and go around and play. But and of course that's part of what I've been doing with our rock band, which is a robot as a as a lead 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 singer, because that's just it's a fun thing to do. The robots getting a chance to play music and and, and interact in 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 the, in the setting where you know the risk of failure is, is is very low like compared to a medical context or something but virtual right. world is easier right so in the virtual world you can make these little guys they can run around they can build stuff they can knock stuff down they can collaborate to make cool toys and the uh, playground equipment and amusement park for them to jump jump around on if it if it doesn't work it doesn't work they can do something else and if some of the human players in sophia verse want to help the little guys to do something, they can do that too. Then they can they can learn from learn from the people, right? If they if they want to learn English from people in the virtual world, they can do that. If they want to make up their own weird language, then they can do that also. They can try to teach it to people, right? So I, I think I mean AI is big business now, which is amazing. And that that I mean that's important. That's what will bring in the human and financial resources to really Build out, build out a, a, a GI, right? But you, you don't want mm -hmm. the big business aspect to completely distract from the need for an AGI 
to learn like a baby or, or a child and just just play, play and, and experiment. And I think a virtual world like metaverse setting can be can be ideal for that for that both because it's it's cheap compared to robots and it's mm -hmm. a domain where people and ais can sort of explore and, and interact in, in a very natural and, and, and simple way and i think compared to chatbots there's a lot for the ai to learn from a sort of 3d environment even even the simulated Hmm. one rather than the physical world because i mean you've got you've got multiple people and multiple ais like interacting in a shared space you have mm -hmm. perception and, and 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 movement and language sort of all all integrated together you have clear ways for like multiple agents some humans some ai to work together to achieve goals like building stuff or or, or or finding stuff, creating art and so forth. I think it's it's a much richer environment than just chat, chatting back and, and forth. Right. Yeah, because there's already um, text to video, um, image to image, you know, we're starting to get, you know, the prompts are starting to look less and less fresh every day. Uh, I would say, even though their, their accuracy in their output, uh, the AI models that are creating, uh, for example, art, um, or videos are, are getting more and more, uh, realistic or just, uh, higher performing and, and novel. But, um, it seems like what you're, proposing in uh, Sophia verse is a lot more uncharted territory from what everyone else is doing right now. Um, yeah, that's cool. I mean, I, I like think, a video game style. I think, uh, yeah, there's, there's two thinking about generative image models as well as generative text models. I mean, there's mm -hmm. with the generative text models, there's really two big weaknesses. I mean, one is, they hallucinate, right? They're not well grounded in, in, in reality. They just make stuff up and they don't know that right. they're making stuff up. And this this ties in with the difficulty at sort of complex multi-stage reasoning. Because mm -hmm. if they could reason better, they would realize some of the stuff they're saying makes no sense relative to other things in their own knowledge base, right? And mm -hmm. then, then the other aspect besides inability at reasoning and grounding of knowledge is they're not really that creative when you come down to it like it it's cool that chat gpt can write a poem in any style about any topic but they're mm -hmm. all bad poems right <laughs> I mean, and and i mean i mean i mean in terms of mid journey stable diffusion or adobe's image generation mm -hmm. i mean it's inc incredible that you can like you know you can you can ask for a you know, a classic Buick driving on the highway with five aliens inside it, and it will do something like that. Even yeah. if it gives, gives. I mean, I mean, it's it's amazing. On the other hand, they're cliche aliens, right? And that's, I mean, mm -hmm. that's right. That's fine. Right, right, right. I mean, it's fine. It's fine for most commercial art purposes. I mean, it's. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, most most commercial graphic art is not like pioneering new territory in visual right. expression and metaphor either either right but on, on, on the other hand it's uh, if that was all there was like all human artistic progress would stop right like like if you think in yeah. music if you if you trained a neural net of the current type on mm -hmm. all music up to eight, 1900 let's say I mean, that would be it. Like, you would never get jazz. You'd never get neoclassical right. metal or EDM. Like, you, you would be frozen at sort of shallow recombinations of music as it existed in, in 1900. Like, it, it sort of creates within the vein and genres of what it's been fed. But right. it, can't, it can't invent something that's really artistically novel or scientifically mm -hmm. novel, right? And I, I think economically that only matters a little bit because probably 80 percent of jobs that people do don't require any original thinking or creation anyway higher percent than that right so but but 
in terms of like fundamental human progress, it, it's it's a big deal. And I, I think using different sort of AI architecture, mm -hmm. you can make AI that's good at multi-step reasoning and that's good at sort of like wild ass fundamental creativity. But that that has to do with both the architecture and algorithms behind the AI and with what sorts of things the AI is doing, right? And so I think mm -hmm. if you want AIs that learn to be creative, having AIs that run around and play like little kids, even if in the virtual world, is a good way to help train an AI mind to be, to be creative because you're putting it in a context where it can just do just do what, whatever and, and explore, right? And uh, rather than having to deliver commercial product and being judged on the commercial product all, 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 all the time. So it's, uh, but the, the cool thing is we can do all these things in parallel, right? You can do practical stuff. You can do like weird, weird, artistic, playful stuff. And with the, the speed of current computers, the amount of data out there, and the current enthusiasm for doing stuff with AI, like it, it seems we're in a phase where we can try all these different things in, in, in parallel. Yeah, so um, you were talking about kind of like the unoriginality of uh, mid-journey output or, you know, to name a name, but, uh, you know, typical uh, AI art generative uh, output and also chat GPT, for example. Um, you know, there's this, uh, there's some, research on music that shows that people actually find music that is familiar to them to be more enjoyable than music that is very different from what they're used to. And so uh, when people hear a new song, actually, um, if that song kind of resembles a lot of the patterns of what they're used to um, from their own cultural experiences of that music style, they're more inclined to think of it favorably. And so you know, when you're talking about these, uh, the popularity, uh, for example, of um, these uh, generative AI systems, uh, you know, and how they might lack some originality. Um, and because of that, they may have gained popularity because what they output is so familiar, like the familiar alien kind of representation and whatnot. Um, you know, it's, uh, and what you're vouching for is more originality. Um, but I wonder, is that originality just like at its core random number generation? If something, you know, can it even truly be random uh, number? Um, I, uh, I, I a think, random number I think no, this is a, it's. Do you see where I'm going? Like, Yeah, but so these are deep points, but they've been thought about for many decades in, in the cognitive science field. I mean, there's a mm -hmm. whole. There's a whole science of of human creativity and how it works in, in, in the brain and mind. And the, the thing is, so one of the main engines of creativity is what's called concept blending. So in, in a way, creativity is always sort of mutating and combining things that, that came before. I mean, and you can look at, say, jazz came about as a combination of West African drumming and say the chordal and harmonic structure from western classical music right or mm -hmm. neoclassical metal i mean it's obvious you have heavy metal music and then, and then you have the melodic structures from classical music and, and you put it mm -hmm. together and you get you know ingvi malmsteen and dream theater and so forth right but the yeah. the thing is you're when you're doing concept blending in a profoundly creative way you're combining things at a certain level of abstraction. And LLMs right now are combining things at a lesser level of abstraction. So if, okay. if, if something like music gen or music LM, which are the, the language models for music generation that we have now from Google and Facebook, if you ask these to combine Western African classical music Western African drumming, rather, with Western classical music, mm -hmm. they're going to do something more like putting Mozart to West African polyrhythms. Right, right. Is, I see what you're cool, saying is it, less noise, it, 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 right? Yeah, it, it's 
it's cool, but it's not Duke Ellington, right? So, I mean, to to combine, to blend West African drumming and Western classical music in the way that people did to create jazz, you're not yeah. just combining the surface level patterns. You're combining right, right. more of the, the abstract structures but but behind behind the surface level patterns, and mm -hmm. that's sort of not how large language models work. Large language models are like a right. humongous index of an insane number of of surface level patterns. So that's a, mm -hmm. it's a, it's great for many purposes, though. I mean, like if if you're if you're say as as one example from the music domain. If you have a five minute song and you want it to be a two minute song to use in an advertisement, now what people will normally do is just fade after two minutes, right? But that's kind of lame. What a language model, what an AI model could do, you could just figure out a new ending, right? Just right. figure out a new chord change. It makes a new ending after two minutes. So it sounds natural to end at the end of the ad after two minutes. And that's, you know, a human musician could do that that but it's more work no one does that they just fade right so i mean you can right there's a lot of things like that which require understanding of the music to a certain level but they don't really require you don't want a fundamental cre creativity there you're not wanting to create a new genre right or take right. take another example like my five-year-old and two-year-old kid watch these little videos on on, on youtube like there's there's these videos like 10 little dinosaurs, right? So they sing this stupid little song about baby dinosaurs. It's a baby stegosaurus and a baby edaphosaurus and a baby diplodocus, right? And they, they sing the same stupid little song about, about each kind of baby dinosaur, but mm -hmm. they only cover 20 baby dinosaurs, right? So kids would love to see that. There's thousands of species of dinosaurs. Like what? Why yeah. not extend these silly little songs to hundreds of kinds of baby dinosaurs, right? And actually what the kids want is kind of the same predictable thing, just extended to more species of dinosaur. You don't, you don't, you don't need to invent a new genre of music for that, right? And now right. There's, not, there's not a business model sufficient to pay a human band to keep doing this for more kinds of dinosaurs. But I mean, why, why not? Kids will enjoy it. It'll help teach teach them more of, of paleontology, right? So, I mean, right. that, there's loads of real applications for AI to generate music that's not that original. It's it's cool that it's there. It just doesn't. It shouldn't be the only thing that's there, right? It, it's it's good that it's good that we will soon have AIs that can also do more original stuff. And I mean, indeed, as you say most of this time when something new and original comes out, not many people want to listen to it. And then after a while, it gets refined to that core audience of early adopters. It gets refined into something that that a lot of people do want to listen to, right? Like we had, I mean, I remember in, when I was a little kid, synthesizers were new. You had like a Switched on Bach. It was an album of these guys playing playing Bach fugues on the synthesizer. And my dad had that album. Not many people did. It was weird, right? Then, but it was maybe, you know, seven years after that or 10 years after that, you had Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, the message, like launching hip hop. You had D D D Donna Summer with dr drum machines and synths. And then it's, it's everywhere. Like it didn't take that long from like, Switched on Bach or Jean Michel Jarre Oxygen, which was like a high end artistic synthesizer music, didn't take too long to get from that for it to be in the mainstream and to become the new the new cliche, right? And so, right, I think right, AI can do all of this, but to get back to decentralization, uh huh, yeah, we what's, digress. What's interesting, what's interesting, <laughs> what's interesting in music is, I mean. Musical creativity is decentralized. It's just musicians mm -hmm. farting around in their garages and bedrooms inventing new stuff, right? And yeah. musical listening is certainly decentralized. A lot of people want to listen to music right? and even mm -hmm. become fans of local bands or something in a decentralized way. 
but music business has been extremely centralized, right? And it was right. extremely centralized with music labels. Then, you know, stuff like Napster and BitTorrent decentralized it a bit for a little while in an illegal but pioneering way. And, and then got centralized again with streaming services, which are now collecting all the money, leaving none for, for musicians, right? With, right. Uh, with Spotify and Apple. Apple, Apple Music and, and so forth. So now, as AI becomes the next big thing in music, there's an opportunity for this to either be used in a way that strengthens the entrenched centralized forces in music industry, or mm -hmm. to be done in a way that, that decentralizes again, as, as BitTorrent and Napster tried to, right? Because you can imagine, like, if major music labels or Spotify or Apple just start using AI to, to auto produce the next hit songs, then mm -hmm. they're just cutting out the annoying human musicians from Spotify and Apple music altogether. Right. <laughs> so I mean, you, you just AI composes it. Then big company mm -hmm. streams it. People listen to it and pay for it. Human musicians contributed the training data and didn't get paid for that. And then, then right. Human musicians are totally, totally obsolete, right? Except for the like two percent of the human population who want to seek out weird, weird indie stuff. On the other mm -hmm. hand, if the AI is running on a decentralized platform, and the sort of training and tweaking and control of the AI is just done by random musicians and random fans around the world, mm -hmm. then you could have the AI revolution as applied to music, like you could have that be something that subverts the streaming platforms and shifts music back into a sort of more decentralized economic model, right? Because AI yeah. will disrupt the music industry, which is an, it's potentially an opportunity for disruption of the centralized business model. Yeah. but also an opportunity for strengthening the centralized business model, right? So this is a, the the Gem Galaxy project, which you can see at gemgalaxy.com. So this this is a singularity net ecosystem project, which is which is tr trying trying to uh, trying to decentralize the music industry, and in particular the application of AI for the music industry. So like any musician can upload tracks or stems for tracks and AI models will be trained in that on a decentralized cloud, then if those AI models are used to generate music for someone, everyone whose music was used to train the AI model gets a little bit of compensation from it, right? So you're tr trying to create the, the next phase of the music industry where everything's AI powered in a way that is running on decentralized infrastructure and that uses tokenomics to fairly compensate people for, for, for contributing data to the AI. Now that whether that can succeed in upending you know Spotify and Apple Music and so on remain remains to be remains to be determined, but it certainly is something that that should be tried, right? I mean, it seems seems there's a little more opportunity for that in music than in visual art, but I'm I'm hoping the same thing can happen in in. In, 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 in visual art, but I, I see like Adobe is moving fast in in AI image image generation, right? Which mm -hmm. is on the one hand great; these are great tools, right? On on, on the other hand, it, it means that like uh, big big centralized technology providers are in their own way moving in to to try to oligopolize the, the AI for our art generation space. So with Sophiaverse, yeah. again, we're trying to open that up, at least in the domain of creating like 3D and 4D content for the metaverse. Because that's like, there's no Adobe for the metaverse exactly, right? So that I think right. there's an opportunity for metaverse content creation to be done in like a more open and, and decentralized sort of way. Yeah, um, there's a lot to take in there. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, yeah you know, yeah. one of the things about music, uh-huh, go for it. No, 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 go on, go on. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm just thinking out loud here. Um, you said that music probably has a better chance of being um, effectively decentralized away from uh, it's more centralized and more um, predictable generative AI output right now. Um, is it in, and this is just a small question and aside, in your experience is as a humanoid um, creator, is it that uh, naturally that the human brain, just from a visual perspective, um, prefers realistic uh, input output versus um, like music? We can listen to things that are more uh, randomized or new music, whereas we don't like to see things that don't match our our preconceptions of what reality should look like. And then we project that onto generative AI output within Ooh. Uh, art and so there's less there, 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 there is a, there is a difference yeah yeah there's certainly differences I mean music music does imitate sounds of nature but in a less thoroughgoing way I mean drum beats are like heartbeat right and and, and yeah uh, I, I mean the the rise and fall of pitch that we like in melodies resembles the sort of Doppler shift of frequency we hear when footsteps go away and, and come back. So I mean in the in the ultimate in the ultimate root I think a lot of music re reflects rhythms of the human body and then rhythms of, 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 of human emotion, right? Like I mean the rise and uh -huh. fall of emotion yeah. in a song has to sort of sink in with the rise and fall of emotion in our in our body for it to be emotionally moving. And then in like huh. atonal modern classical music, in atonal modern cl classical music, they intentionally tried not to do that, right? They tried to break free of of imitating the patterns of human emotion, like, oh, I'm, I'm so excited, I'm so excited, oh, I'm let down, right? So you, I mean, there's a certain <laughs> rhythm to that in your body which is imitated in, 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 in music. And you, you totally feel it if you're on stage playing with the band, right? In yeah. modern, like Schoenberg and Schoenberg and Weber and my, or if you're dancing, right? But I mean, Schoenberg and Weber and these modern classical composers didn't like that. And they tried to compose music using formal structures that intentionally didn't, didn't try to appeal to human emotions because they just thought that was crass. They wanted to make music with appeal to the mind. The result is they made music that pretty much nobody ever wants to listen to, right? I mean, it's interesting, but it doesn't doesn't feel compelling. But still, right. that imitate that imitativeness in music is is buried a little bit. It's in the timing and the structure, but it's not uh -huh. like the detailed sound of music tries to imitate sounds that you heard in nature. Whereas art art is more often imitative. I mean, you have, of course. Kandinsky or Mondrian, right? I mean, you you have you have abstract art that doesn't try to imitate anything, but yeah. it's a little, little bit off to the side. Most commercial art is is Im Im imitating stuff, some some right. somehow, right? And so that that's yeah, that that makes it a little different. And text is also different, right? Because in in visual art, hallucination is sort of a feature. In text, mm -hmm. unless you're doing poetry, it's 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 a bug, right? You don't you don't want the AI to make to make stuff up, and in, yeah. in music or visual, you you, you 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 do want the AI to make stuff up. And getting, I mean, getting a feel of this, it's hard for current generative models because they have no meta knowledge. Like the the AI doesn't know why it's doing what it's doing. It doesn't know who you are, or how it relates to you. It doesn't mm -hmm. know how what it's doing fits into your life or, 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 or your business, right? Like it, it doesn't know that in this context, hallucination is bad. In that context, hallucination is good. Like the, if right. AI is controlling our Grace medical robot, it doesn't know it's talking to a sensitive old person in a hospital. In a sense, it knows that, but it doesn't know that in a thoroughgoing way that integrates with its whole knowledge base, right? So it, it doesn't understand why it should be tentative about what it's saying when talking to this hundred-year-old lady in the hospital, and why it doesn't need to be tentative about what it's saying, what's reciting poetry on stage with our band, right? I mean, it sort of knows that it could parrot that back, but it doesn't mm -hmm. know it in the sense of having that interwoven with its whole 
its all being and it, its its motivation and it, its 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 goals and so forth. So I think as as we get AI that has moves further toward general intelligence, which we're aiming at with hyper and so on, right? As we get mm-hmm. AI that's moving further toward general intelligence, we will then have AI that understands like what the setting is, why it's doing what it's doing, who it's talking to, and what they want right. out of the conversation and so on. Then then right. then the AI will know when to improvise and hallucinate and, and when not to. It will know when yeah. to, you know, be derivative and permute on stuff it's seen before versus when to take a creative stab out into the dark that 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 may fail right and i think mm-hmm. ai is going to advance toward agi in this sense pretty fast during the next few years i think mm-hmm. and okay i think the decentralized the decentralized infrastructure is just barely there to allow us to build the next wave of ai on decentralized infrastructure so you look at Chat GPT obviously is super super centralized. It's Microsoft, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. If if we can build if we can build the next wave of AI, which is smarter than Chat GPT and can reason better and can be more creative than Chat GPT, if we can build this next wave of AI on top of a decentralized tech stack involving things like Singularity Net and Ocean and NuNet and HyperCycle and blah blah blah, right? That, that, then then we'll have a huge win, right? Because then suddenly, suddenly we're gonna have a huge chunk of the world economy, not just smarter than before, but running on running on decentralized tech stack owned by owned by everyone and no one, right? And I think that's right. that's what the game is for the next say, for the next like two to five years. Like try to try to build something way smarter than Chat GPT in a whole bunch of different dimensions. By integrating mm-hmm. a broader variety of, of AI approaches along with deep neural nets, but try to do this in a way that can be rolled out on a decentralized tech stack, so it's not controlled by any big companies or any small set of governments, right? And I think I think we have we have a decent chance of doing this. I mean, mm-hmm. we like three four years ago decentralized tech stack was too primitive and slow and expensive now it's like barely getting there to where it could support this this sort of massive massive ai system so it's it mm-hmm. but that's that's how the hollywood movie is supposed to be right you're supposed to be just barely able to pull it off if it was a, if it was easy to do it wouldn't be exciting enough i had a great time talking with you ben i hope you know that just outside of the script um, but, uh, guys, let us know in the comments, uh, below what you thought of this. We love reading your feedback and anything weird or awesome that you would like to say or negative, whatever. Um, and, uh, give us a like, subscribe to our channel for more content like this in the future. <laughs>